When you read about the sea beast, the land beast, and the mark of the beast in Revelation 12 and 13, in preparing for the events ahead, where do you fall? Doomsday prepper, conspiracy theorist, or hopeful optimistic? Welcome back. I promise you this would be an epic journey through the unseen. And these episodes have been an eye opener and a turning point for many. This one is no different. This is the 11 part of a 13 part series that is very different from the traditional thoughts and ideas about the world around us. There are things and entities around us that we cannot see, hear, or even imagine. We're in a war between the forces of good and evil. It is a war for our souls. It is designed to strip us of our knowledge of God, His Word, and our relationship with Him. We have been looking at this cosmic battle, exploring the origin of sin, the nature of sin, its history, and what will lead to the ultimate showdown between Christ and Satan. This series is about understanding the forces at play and our place within the universal struggle. Every episode, every moment of this journey matters because, like it or not, this is a war that touches all of us. It is about a God who loves us so much that he was willing to give his life to maintain a relationship with us and obtain our worship. We are looking at scenes in the book of Revelation. Many fear it, some dread it, and most shun reading it claiming that it is a sealed book. But it's sealed, why is it called Revelation? We must delve into this book to understand the forces around us and know what the future holds for our world. In this series, we seek to identify the dreadful beast in Revelation 12 and 13. But before we discuss these beasts, as we always do, let's take a moment to invite God's presence. And if you have not viewed the previous videos, go back and view them at sabbathschooldaily.com. Heavenly Father, the book of Revelation is a complex book, feared and dreaded by many. Give us an open heart and mind to receive what you have revealed through your servant John. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wondered about the mark of the beast it is a topic in closing mystery and speculation and it has captured the curiosity of many some believe this mark could be some modern technology like biochip or vera chip which is about the size of a grain of rice this chip is designed to store a patient's medical history and can be scanned by doctors to retrieve vital health information. Some view this chip as a part of a conspiracy to enforce the mark of the beast. On the other hand, there are those who view the mark of the beast symbolically as a barcode, like the one we find on food cans. Others suggest that it is a mysterious number on the dollar bill that adds up to 666. Still others associated with secret societies like the Masonic Order, the Illuminati, the Black UN helicopters, or the United Nations. In this series, our aim is to raise your awareness of the coming conflict. The promises in the scriptures help us endure this conflict. Through the scriptures, we become established in the truth through Christ, our Redeemer, who sanctifies us as expressed in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This final conflict is centered around worship. The enemy Satan will attempt to dispute God's authority, undermining God's law by directly assaulting his Sabbath. Why the Sabbath? Because it is God's divine sign identifying him as our creator, and justifying his right to receive our worship. Therefore, Satan hates the Sabbath. Thus, he will make the Sabbath the center of a global conflict. Recall that the battle between Christ and Satan is about worship. Satan wants us to worship him. 
Yet the Sabbath commands that we worship God, our creator, the one who made the heavens and the earth. To force us to break our allegiance to God, our creator, Satan will use compulsion, pressure, and even force to escalate the battle for our allegiance to him. He will go as far as putting economic sanctions on those who insist on worshiping God on the day he has set aside for worship from the beginning of creation. In other words, he will use the government to pass economic laws that prevent those who choose to worship God from buying or selling if they persist in worshiping God on the day he is established. In fact, in this collision of beliefs over the true and false day of worship, Satan will seek to use government officials to coerce those who persist in worshiping God on the day he is set aside for worship by enacting laws leveraged by imposing the fear of imprisonment or death. But we must obey God rather than man. Thus, God's final appeal is an appeal for us to remain faithful to him and his word despite persecution, economic sanctions, imprisonment, and even the threat of death. The book of Revelation tells us that there will be a fierce attack on God's people in earth's final conflict between good and evil before Christ returns. This series emphasizes that our victory in this conflict is not by might or our power, but by the power of Jesus. Jesus has promised to take us through earth's final conflict. Revelation 14 calls for humanity to worship the creator. The final conflict is over worship. Many claim to be worshiping the creator. But how does Revelation describe the true worshipers of God? Read Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12. Continue to part two, Revelation's final conflict. Far beyond its cryptic symbols, strange beasts, hard images, Revelation stands as a divine light guiding the final generation on earth through the tumultuous end times. It is composed of eternal truths given by a loving God to an end time generation. The conflict we witness in Revelation is not new. It began in heaven between Christ and Satan and revolved around the issue of worship. This conflict continues to the end with the final battle also centering on whom we choose to worship. When we examine passages like Revelation 14, 7, and 9, and compare them with Revelation 4, 11, a clear theme emerges. Revelation 14, 7, 9 through 10 says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any one worship the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This theme is of the worthiness of God. This scripture tells us to worship him who made the heavens and the earth, highlighting the link between creation and worship. In fact, Revelation 14, 7 calls for us to worship the Lord of all creation. In contrast to the theory of evolution, which has held many captive for the past two centuries, the Sabbath is an eternal reminder of who we are, whose we are, and how we got here. Revelation constantly stresses that we are created beings and that the one who created us is worthy of our loyalty and worship. This is one of the reasons Satan hates the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a constant reminder that we are beings created by God. Thus, God is worthy of our allegiance and the Sabbath is important to help us remember because through its observance, 
we are reminded of our creator. Moreover, the Sabbath reminds us not only of God's creative power, but also of our identity, who we are in his eyes. The Sabbath is so crucial that it becomes a central point of contention in the war between Christ and Satan. As we approach the end of Earth's history, Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12 prompts us to consider how we will demonstrate our allegiance and show our final expression of worshiping God as our creator. True worshipers of God, Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The demarcation or dividing line between the true worshipers of God and the counterfeit worshipers are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Worshiping the creator by keeping the commandments of God stands in direct opposition to worshiping the beast. In other words, as expressed in the lesson study, God will have an end time people who are loyal to him despite the greatest opposition and fiercest persecution in history. Notice what it says in the book, The Great Controversy, regarding how our loyalty to God will be expressed. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of our loyalty to the Creator. In these critical times, as we face challenges that test our faith and loyalty, the decisions we make today determine the decisions we make tomorrow. Let us choose to honor the God who created us, bearing witness to his truth through our lives and our worship. Revelation 14, 12 identifies the committed followers of Christ as those having the faith of Jesus. What is the faith of Jesus? The lesson study points puts it this way. The faith of Jesus is a faith so deep that it trusts when it cannot see. It perseveres when it cannot understand. It is a gift from Jesus that we receive by faith and will carry us through the impending conflict. What can we expect in the impending conflict? View the next segment of this video, part three, the coming crisis. Revelation 13 reveals the severity of Satan's war against God and his faithful people. As we look at chapter 13, remember the victory has already been won. It is therefore our relationship with Jesus that shapes our path and our future as we move forward. Revelation 13 unfolds with the horrible details of the mark of the beast. It illustrates the climax in Satan's fiercest and worst stage of his war against God. Despite his ultimate defeat at the cross, Satan continues his destructive effort knowing he has only a short time. His tactics evolve from deception to coercion. When deception does not work, he resorts to force. He urges world leaders to enact laws that persecute those who resist worshiping the beast or accepting its mark. He is the one ultimately behind a death decree that if anyone who refuses to worship the beast or receive his mark will be put to death. Historically, God's people have faced persecution for their persistent faith. From Cain's murder of Abel due to Abel's obedience to God, to the promised tribulation Jesus spoke of, where even believers would betray one another, the scriptures are clear. In John 16, 2, Matthew 10, 22, 2 Timothy 3, 12, and 1 Peter 4, 12, followers of Christ, have endured and will endure great tribulation. Notice what they say in John 16, 2. They will be put out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. 2 Timothy 3, 12. 
Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. For those who choose to love godly, live godly, they will suffer persecution. The persecution during the New Testament times by pagan Rome and later during the Middle Ages by the Roman Church serve as sobering reminders of the lengths to which earthly powers will go to suppress true faith. These historical events set the stage for understanding the magnitude of the challenge facing God's end time people. As the lesson points out, the mark of the beast is the final link in this hellish chain. Like past persecutions, it is designed to force everyone to conform to certain sets of beliefs and approved system of worship. Revelation 13, 5 and 17 warns of a future where economic sanctions like the no buy, no sell law will enforce compliance with the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 15 says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. The prophecy indicates that persecution will start with economic sanctions. No one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. And anyone who refuses to receive it will eventually be placed under a death decree. Satan is now preparing professed Christians to receive the mark of the beast by encouraging them to disregard God's commandments so that when the final test comes, compromise will be easy. When it appears that the whole world is following the beast in wondering admiration, as expressed in Revelation 13, 3, suddenly the scene changes. And the prophetic lens focuses on the people of God, those who refuse to receive the mark. Thus, ultimately, this leads to a death decree for dissenters. Yet, in this prophetic darkness, there is a ray of hope. Revelation 14, 12 gives us this picture saying, Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In contrast to the world following the beast, by the grace of Jesus, the people of God are depicted in Revelation 14, 4 as following the Lamb wherever he goes. They are unwaveringly faithful. They are God's remnant who choose to follow the Lamb, Jesus, regardless of the consequences. Therefore, by the power of Christ, they triumph over the power of hell that stands against him. As expressed in Lesson 9, the core of the battle between good and evil is worship. To obtain it, the beast uses deception, and when deception fails, he resorts to force and coercion. But we can anchor our hearts in the assurance of Jesus' victory. Now is the time to evaluate our own faith and readiness, that we may be able to stand firm. As we approach the perils of the last days, the temptations of the enemy become stronger and more determined. Satan has come down in great power knowing that his time is short and he is working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. The warning comes to us through God's word that if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Who is the beast? What are his identifying characteristics and how can we avoid wandering after him? Continue to the next segment of this video, part four, identifying the beast part one the beast is a central figure in the apocalyptic vision of revelation it emerges from the sea clothed in mystery and power but where does this beast come from and who grants it its authority revelation 13 1 through 2 provides some insight then i stood on the sand of the sea and i saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns, and on his head, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, 
his throne and great authority. This beast rising out of the sea receives his power, throne and great authority from the dragon who is identified primarily as Satan. It is important to understand that the book of Revelation is intertwined with real world events and entities. For instance, Revelation 12, three through five vividly recounts the dragon's attempt to destroy the male child, Jesus, through the kingdom of pagan Rome. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. Revelation 12, three through five says the dragon attempts to destroy as soon as it was born, the male child, who was later caught up to God and his throne. And it echoes in the historical account of Herod's massacre in Matthew 2, 16 through 18. It was Satan working through pagan Rome to destroy Christ, the enemy of God and humanity works through political and religious institutions to accomplish his purposes. His method of leveraging political and religious systems to execute his plan is a recurring theme throughout the scripture. The transition of power to the sea beast is detailed in Revelation 13 too, in which the dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. This prophecy was precisely fulfilled hundreds of years later coinciding with a significant historical shift when the Roman Emperor Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople, which is modern-day Turkey. This left Rome's throne vacant, setting the stage for the rise of the Roman Church, which, as some Bible scholars like Isaac Bacchus and Thomas Hobbes point out, the Church assumed the mantle of Roman authority. This shift symbolically and practically represents the transfer of imperial power to a religious institution that would blend church and state in a way that profoundly impact Christian doctrines and practice. Furthermore, Revelation 13 highlights the nature of the sea beast's blasphemy. The beast is described as speaking great things and blasphemes against God. A careful evaluation reveals that the sea beast of Revelation 13 is an apostate religious power that rises out of Rome and becomes a worldwide system of worship. Revelation 13, three through four says, speaking of the dragon and the sea beast, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him. This beast is not a person. It is a religious power that has substituted the truth of God's word for human decrees. Revelation 13, one and six, speaking of the sea beast described in Revelation 13, one six says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and 10 horns and on his horns, 10 crowns and on his head, a blasphemous name. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. This is critical in identifying the beast as it mirrors accusations made against Jesus during his ministry, where he was accused of blasphemy proclaiming divine prerogative as expressed in John 10, 33 and Luke 5, 21. Using these two examples, the Bible defines blasphemy as one, a man pretending to be or claiming to be God, and two, a man claiming the power to forgive sin. Of course, these accusations against Jesus are not justified because he's God. Therefore, he has the right to forgive sin. Yet, as this lesson points out in the study guide, the Roman papacy without divine authority maintains two distinctive doctrines that the Bible calls blasphemy. It claims that its priests have the power to forgive sin and that the Pope has the rights of God on earth. Why is this significant? Continues in the next segment of this video, 
Part 5, Identifying the Beast, Part 2. Revelation 13, 5 sheds light on the reign and influence of the sea beast, saying, And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. We can see that the sea beast is not our friend. Therefore, rather than worshiping the beast, the people of God delight in worshiping Jesus. Springing out of a heart of love of their creator, they obey God. Knowing just how committed God is to them, they offer their complete loyalty to him. Revelation 13, 5 reveals that the sea beast was granted authority to exercise control over both political and religious power for a period of 42 months. To understand this, we apply a prophetic principle from the Bible where one prophetic day equals one literal year according to Numbers 14.34 and is equal for six. With each Hebrew month traditionally counted as 30 days, the 42 months translate into 1,200 prophetic days or literal years. This period historically corresponds to the phase of substantial papal power. The papacy exercised great influence from 538 AD when the Pope was recognized as the supreme religious authority until AD 1798, marked by Napoleon's general Berthier capturing the Pope. This marked the ending of the papacy's political and religious power and the fulfillment of the prophecy in Revelation 13.10, which says, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Though this was a serious blow to the papacy, it was not fatal. This setback, referred to in Revelation 13.2 as a deadly wound, indicates that it will heal, hinting at a recovery of influence for the papacy. Thus, the papacy's influence would be felt worldwide. Today, we see evidence of increasing global interaction with the Church of Rome through the influence of the Pope. This interaction involves both political leaders and massive public gatherings, suggesting a movement toward a unified religious leadership under the papacy. In fact, world leaders welcome the pontiff as an ambassador of the Church of Rome and visit him regularly at the Vatican. As mentioned in the study guide for this lesson, in a world of unprecedented instability, the scene is being set for the Roman pontiff to become the acclaimed moral leader of the world who can bring people together. One compelling example of this is the emphasis on Sunday observance advocated by Pope Benedict XVI during his speech on June 6, 2012, to more than 15,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square in Rome. He declared, Sunday is the day of the Lord and of men and women, a day in which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God. In defending Sunday, we defend human freedom. His declaration links Sunday worship not just to faith, but also to societal values like family and freedom. This advocacy echoes the historical conflict and future implications highlighted in the Great Controversy, which warns of coming challenges for those who observe the biblical Sabbath, forecasting societal and legal repercussions for Sabbath keepers, portrayed as dissenters against societal norms and government laws. It says, those who honor the Bible, Sabbath, will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption and calling down the judgment of God upon the earth. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. Nevertheless, the history and future outline in Revelation encourages us to remain vigilant, steadfast, and informed about our beliefs and the world around us. 
we must go to God for ourselves and pray for divine enlightenment so that we may know the truth. When Satan's wonderful miracles, working power is displayed and he comes as an angel of light, we may, through our knowledge of the truth, distinguish between the genuine work of God and the imitative work of the powers of darkness. For all that receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, will be left to accept strong delusions that they should believe a lie. What about the second beast? The beast that comes up out of earth, as mentioned in Revelation 13, 11. Read Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Then continue to the next segment of this video. Part six, the beast from the earth. Revelation 13 introduces to us two distinct beasts, each emerging from different origins and symbolizing different powers. The first beast arises from the sea, which represents people, multitudes of nations, and tongues as expressed in Revelation 17, 15. This beast is interpreted as a form of global political and religious authority that combines powers and influence using diverse populations. In contrast, the second beast referring to in Revelation 13, 11, which says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. This second beast comes from the earth, which must represent a thinly populated area of the world. Thus the emergence of the land beast signifies a new kind of power that is different from the chaotic populated sea. The second beast arises near the close of the prophetic period, during which the first beast exercises authority as indicated in Revelation 13, 5. Historically, this second beast rise to power aligns with the timeline around AD 1798, a period marked by the diminishing authority of the first beast. The identity of the second beast is linked to the United States of America. It precisely fits this description. For instance, America declares its independence in AD 1776, adopted its constitution in AD 1789, and was recognized as a world power by the late 19th century. By the late 1800s, the United States has emerged as a formidable power on the global scene. In Revelation, this beast is described saying he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. The lamb-like horn suggests an appearance of innocence and gentleness, reflecting America's foundational values of religious freedom and civil liberties. As expressed in the study guide, horns in Bible prophecy symbolize power. Unlike the first beast, this beast had no crowns on its horns, suggesting that it is not a kingdom. The two horns represent the two primary governing principles that are the source of the United States power and success, political and religious liberty. However, a dramatic transformation occurs in the character of the second beast. Initially embodying lamb-like qualities, it begins to speak like a dragon mirroring the deceptive and coercive nature of the first beast. This change indicates a shift from a policy of freedom and tolerance to one of compulsion, particularly in matters of faith. Revelation 13, 12 reveals that this beast exercises all the authority of the first beast and mandates worship of the first beast symbolizing a wearing away of the idea of the separation between church and state and imposing the idea of religious uniformity. It abandons its principles of religious liberty, causing the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast as indicated in Revelation 13, 12. The United States will lead out in requiring everyone on earth to worship the first beast, by recognizing the papacy's spiritual and secular authority. According to this prophecy, the United States formed an image to the beast, a union of church and state, and it will require everyone to worship this image. What's fascinating is that at the time when 
first identified as this beast power, the United States was nowhere near the military and economic giant it was to become and remains now. The great controversy points out that in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish their own ends. The image to the beast represents the form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches will seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Although church and state will unite their powers to compel all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast, yet the people of God will not receive it. Thus, understanding these biblical symbols helps us prepare for the challenge of maintaining faith and freedom in the ever-changing world. May we continue to seek wisdom and clarity through scripture, fostering a faith that is informed, resilient, and committed to upholding the truth. Thank you for watching this video. To be notified when my next video comes out, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Sabbath School Daily by Dr. Brenda Ware Davis. You may also obtain a free study guide for these lessons at sabbath.school or ssnet.org. If you enjoyed this video and want to make it available for your friends and family to watch, click like, then share. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing. <music>